There ain't no f***ing way he did that. There ain't no way, bro. I'm sorry. What? Dude, are you joking? I'm saying it. Maryland corrupt cops are everywhere. But what happens when they actually get caught? I can't believe what you're telling me. Here are five shocking examples of when evil cops realize they're going to prison. I love that there are so many fucking cops that go to jail uh, for for being insane that that they literally that we haven't even stumbled upon like the same stories being told again. And starting out with Detective Michael Neely, who was found in a hotel room sitting on top of his police chief's dead body. Mike and his chief Johnny Miller were away for a conference, and one night the two went out looking Wait, for a couple we of watch drinks. This? But after a long night of drinking, Mike woke up in police custody and was immediately taken to the very same room he'd been interrogating oh, suspects in this for the last ten years. But this time, it wasn't him asking the questions. So tell me, Mike, you guys um, flew out of Tulsa? Yeah, they were having a they were having a brotherly tussle. And we've seen the uh, the Steph one too. <clears throat> the Steph one was a JCS one. Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City. Okay. And Pensacola. Yep. Was it a direct flight? Nope. Uh, where, where'd you guys? They were just wrestling. Uh, and then from there, got to the hotel. That's it. Mike is keeping all his answers short, which is a good idea in this situation. But it's up for debate whether it's because he knows it's the best move or just because he's still extremely hungover. Any problems uh, or anything going on in the crowd? Just normal dinner or what? It's normal. Any drinks there or just dining with a couple of beers? And... Was it a early dinner, late dinner or what? Pretty early. It was a. Uh... I don't think it was dark yet. Uh, tell me once what, what you guys did once you got back to the hotel. About it, just watch football game. That was a Dallas game. Sorry. Mike said the night consisted of a football game and a couple beers, but in reality, things went much further than that. Tests reveal that both men's blood alcohol levels were around or above 0.3. To put that in perspective, a level of 0.4 is widely considered to be a fatal dose, and 0.3. Bro, these guys, you can't help but respect it. Okay, these guys are doing new things in the field of blood alcohol content okay like they are these guys are they're pumping they're pumping 0.3 on a minimum every cop video that we watch every cop video we watch they're teetering along the edges of alcohol poisoning that leads you to death from respiratory failure what's going on these fucking piglets man there's a i feel like we're learning a new thing about cop phrenology that we did not know before, which is that cops, uh, on top of having, you know, thumb like skulls and yada yada, they also have this unique ability to just like withstand blood alcohol levels that that the average person would die under. It will likely result in alcohol poisoning, a condition that can lead to death and loss of consciousness. Either way, both men will have been completely out of control of their own emotions and actions, likely leading to the horrifying events that occurred that night. Do you remember um, hotel staff or hotel employee coming up and telling you guys to keep it down? I don't. I don't remember that. So what is the last thing you remember as far as that evening until the football game? Uh, I mean, I, I know you're asking me questions, but can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Okay, homicide, who, 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 who is dead? Dead. Dead? Yes, sir. Uh, I guess I, I probably don't have any, anything else to say then. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got nothing, nothing to say to you. Mike was in... Oh my God, no wonder why they're so afraid of fentanyl. Dude, awfully suspicious that they're afraid of fentanyl because, like, they have so much blood alcohol... Like, they have so much alcohol, awfully suspicious. They don't want to be around lighters either because they're afraid that they're just going to engulf in flame. Just, like, can't be around lighters and can't be around fentanyl, okay? I'm not trying to die. That's why, bro, They that's why they get panic attacks? Yeah, I got panic attack. I'm around fentanyl, and I'm drunk as a skunk right now, brother. I'll fucking die.
never heard from a lot. Initially told he was brought in for a homicide investigation, but only now told that it's his police chief, Miller, who died. Remember, Mike was so drunk last night that he almost certainly doesn't remember a thing. So knowing how bad his current position is, he decides to invoke his right to silence, telling the cops that he's got nothing else to say. But these are trained detectives, and they're about to put all their years of experience to work. Michael, you're being charged with second degree murder. Okay. okay. I, I had no idea what I was being charged with. Yeah, you're being charged with second degree murder, and you're fixing to be booked in the Scammy County Jail with no bond. And we've already notified your uh, your wife. Okay. Uh, and um, the victim. Yes. I'm assuming. Yes. Okay. You have any questions for us? I mean, I've, yeah, I've got a, a thousand of them, but I mean, it really doesn't make it. Well, I mean, sure it does. I mean, if you want to talk, we'll sit here and listen to you talk. I mean, we'd love. Kind of fucked up that they wouldn't blur my man's feet, but they blurred his knees. I don't know what's going on there. I know what the heck happened. I, um, I, but I mean, that's that's up to you. I mean, we'll answer your questions, you know, in return. So I, I would love to know what happened to, uh, you know. Well, I mean, do you want to continue to talk to us? If you do, then I mean, we'll tell you what happened. I mean, I, I I would love I I would like to I would like to know what happened, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm I'm telling you I don't uh, I don't have any memory of of any of this shit, and I I'm, I'm shocked. Do you want us to? You want to continue talking to us? Yeah, I mean, I, I I'll continue to talk. I'd I'd like to know what happened. The detectives used two techniques here to persuade Mike into staying with them. First, they're reminded of the position he's in, almost threatening him with the punishments he's immediately facing. Then they ask if he has any questions for them. Obviously, given that they know Mike has no recollection of the previous night's events, he'll be scrambling to figure out what happened and if there's any way out of it for him. Imagine you woke up in a jail cell being told you're going to prison for killing your boss while blackout drunk. You do everything you could to piece together that night's events. Mike is now starting to realize that's his only option. Watch how his demeanor changes as he starts to almost join in his own investigation. I'm, I'm trying to get you to figure out what's the last thing you remember. Mm -hmm. And if you, the last thing you remember was watching football, uh, do you remember drinking? Yeah. Okay. Were you drinking the vodka? Yeah, I drank some vodka. Okay. okay. So, mm -hmm. well, the first call came a little bit after six, I believe. One of the guys at uh, the room next to you didn't say you guys were arguing, just being loud, just laughing, yelling, probably. So the next noise complaint came out about nine minutes till 10. This time you can't get anybody to come to the door. All he hears, he's knocking. He hears just grumbling, grunting, uses his car to get in, is on the ground between the bed and the wall, you are sitting on his chest. His face is beaten. The statement that was given by the called? second noise complaint could hear a male saying, Mike, stop, Mike, stop. And then it just went quiet. Mike reiterates that he's got absolutely no memory of this and had no animosity towards Miller at any point. However, he also doesn't show remorse at any point. He just sits there confused and quite obviously only concerned for himself, repeating that he just can't believe what happened. The officers detail a little more about Miller's body and try desperately to get Mike to remember anything at all about the events. But he just... I mean, listen, brother. He's a cop. You know, when he blacks out, it's just automatic, right? And when you black out, you automatically do a murder. Well, chalk it up to being a cop. See what I'm saying? His body has to, his body has to react in the way that it knows best, which is murder button. Just sits there in complete disbelief. I mean, you, you can't think of anything that, that would have triggered you to, to jump on? Nothing. I mean, it's nothing. It's, uh, I can just, uh, we'll leave more. Anything else? You got any questions for us, Mike, before we get you across the street? No, I guess I'm getting booked into jail and, uh... Yep, we're gonna, uh, get you booked into jail and put in, uh, special housing over there so that you're not back there with the uh, heads and stuff. Right. <laughs> you're not back there with the criminals. <laughs> the real criminals, you know what I mean? Not you. <laughs> and, uh, 
protective custody. You're not uh I don't know, man. He's a cop who killed another cop. He might he might not be in that much trouble in there, you know what I mean? I feel like they would respect that. You don't want to harm yourself or anything, are you? No. Michael Neely was indeed booked into jail and subsequently sentenced to life in prison on account of second degree murder. But Michael took all this news surprisingly well. He just sat there and accepted his life was basically over in complete contrast to the corrupt tactics of this police captain. Captain James French was caught drinking and driving and followed home yes! by an officer. Dude. At better than drinking and murdering, you know what I mean? Like drinking, drunk driving, once again, yet another police chief, dude. Yet another day, another high ranking police guy drinking and driving, baby. Whoo! He looks like he's got jaundice. Sir, what followed was one of the most brazen examples of police corrupt. I saw the clip chatter. I don't look like you, this kid. Uh, like, I, I don't feel any rejection towards him. I, I used to be. How do I look like him? Like, are you okay? You think I look like this kid? It's insane. You keep spamming it. I looked at it on the other screen and I was like, I'm not going to embarrass you. But like, I don't think I look like that kid. Option ever caught on camera. Stay in your vehicle. Back in your car. I see it. Oh Drunk? my God. <laughs> Drunk. I know I'm the captain. <laughs> That's funny. Are you drunk? No, I'm the captain. <laughs> a what? Captain. A what? The big, don't reach in your pocket. Get back in your car. I have a seat. I, I will. I'm not. You been drinking tonight? I just got a ride. You been drinking tonight, sir? I'm a captain on the police department. What police department? Oklahoma City. What division? Investigations. How much we had to drink tonight? Yeah, he said, turn the camera off. <laughs> Yo, he is zooted. Yeah. Uh, fun fact: cameras can't pick up that frequency of whisper. This must be a different. This must be a different camera. <laughs> or my man is so drunk he thought that would work. Probably the second thing. I assume it was the second thing. But well, awesome. Come on, just turn the camera off. Hi, sir. Please. Huh? I'm not turning my camera off. Okay. <laughs> what? He laughed in his fucking face. I'm not turning my camera off. <laughs> no, it's not a good cop, Chatter. I don't think you understand. No. Chat. It's over. You can't well, you can't turn the camera off. There's no there's no salvaging that. If he turns that off, he's fucked, okay? If he knew ahead of time that this was like a captain, like a police captain, maybe he would have he wouldn't have approached it like this, but even then you have dashboard footage. You can't, like, it's just like the other situation in New Jersey where the cops are like, listen, we don't want to do this to you, but, like, you're fucking cooked. Like, we can't, we, we're cameras on. Like, I can't do anything. Okay. This guy isn't just drunk. He's absolutely hammered. Even to the point. They turn cameras off every day? Yeah, brother. They do. Before they fucking go into, like, apprehend someone. You know how many times they actually, first of all, here, here are some fun facts. Usually, I mean, this changes by jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but I'm pretty sure you get, as soon as you turn your camera off, the camera doesn't actually stop recording, okay? The camera is always on uh, 30 seconds before and 30 seconds after the camera is, uh, is actually turned off. So cops have literally gotten caught turning their camera off to plant evidence and then only to go back and like, oh, be like, oh, I found evidence. This happened in Baltimore before where it's like automatically, it's automatically, uh, uh, it's automatically uh, recording with a delay. Yeah. I'm good, check here. The body cam video shot in January shows a Baltimore police officer searching a garbage strewn backyard. 
He finds a bag of drugs tucked into a soup can. Yo. But the video doesn't actually begin there. It starts 30 seconds earlier. Officer Richard. Yeah, quite literally a 30 second. Uh, it's rolling footage and the camera is turned off. It says that 30 second roll. Yeah. Hi, you. Hey, Walla. <clears throat> if you turn your camera off and arrest a police captain, you're so fucked for the rest of your career. Well, if you turn your camera off and don't arrest the police captain and it fucking and and it shows the 30 seconds of the police captain asking and you complying, you're also fucked. Not after it always runs, but only save when it's turned on. Yeah, when they press the button, the past recorded 30 seconds are saved and everything beyond that. But when they turn it off, the next 30 seconds are not. Oh, OK. Well, it doesn't matter. He walked up to the fucking he walked up to the captain. And the captain requested he turn the camera off. It's over at that point. It's rolling. The moment, the moment that he walked up. Also, the other part of it, for the record, the other part of it is also the dash cam. So the dash cam has a similar, uh, the dash cam has a, a similar situation where as soon as you turn your lights on, as soon as you turn your lights on, that also has rolling footage. The dash cam will, I think it's also 30 seconds prior, but the dash cam also has rolling footage. So even if he rolled up to the car and he didn't, like, turn his camera on or whatever, okay, accidentally, you still have the dash cam that will pick up the audio of, like, him walking up to a drunk uh, a police captain and not actually uh, arresting him. 30 minutes, 30 more minutes. See y'all in a few hours for OK Nud. What? Point where he thinks the camera can't hear him whispering. But despite the captain's pleas, the officer refuses to turn off his camera and continues with the investigation. Go ahead and step out of the vehicle. You gotta be kidding me. How much we drink tonight, sir? I was at a poker game. Uh huh. Because you're swerving all over when you turn off. Yeah, there you go. That means that that means that he was following him. He was swerving all over, which means that the fucking dash cam footage would reflect that, which means that if he walked over there with his camera off and then didn't end up arresting him, like, that would be pretty suspicious. Signal. I'm sorry. How much you drink at your poker game? Not much. Not much? Mm -hmm. How much is not much? I don't know. Beer? Liquor? Yeah. Beer. How many beers? Three or four. Three or four? How long ago was that? It's been going on a while. How long ago did you drink your last beer, sir? What time is it now? It's 0140. Midnight. You think you should drive it? No, but I came from four blocks. Your mom, your mom lives here. I live here. You live here? Yes. Come over to the rear of your vehicle. Okay. You got any weapons or anything on you? I do not, sir. Those must have been a strong few beers, as not only was he stumbling over his words, but apparently also swerving across both lanes on his way home. The captain is then searched and told to stand in the open where he's tested on his balance and sobriety. Hands down by your side, please. Look straight ahead and you see... 15 minute cities would have saved him. Dro drove four blocks at a walking. Yeah, that's nuts. I mean, he's probably exaggerating. He's probably <clears throat> lying. He probably drove longer than four blocks. But if it's four blocks, that's offensive, okay? You tip my pen, sir? I do. I want you to follow tip my pen without moving your head, okay? Come over here. It's a little bit more level. I'm going to demonstrate for you first. While I'm demonstrating, I want you to stand with your feet together, hands down by your side, just like this. All right, sir. What's your name? Matt French. Matt French. Mr. French, stand just like that for me. When I tell you to begin, okay, I'm just going to demonstrate for you first. I want you to pick a foot of your choosing. It doesn't matter if it's your left or your right foot. I'm from here. And I want you to lift it approximately six inches off the ground. And while you look at your toe, I want you to count by 1,000s. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, so on and so forth until I tell you to stop. At any point in time, you lose your balance or your foot touches the ground. Just go ahead and pick your foot back up and continue the count, okay? Do you understand these instructions I've explained to you, I'm Mr. Good. French? You may begin. Ooh. Ooh. Keep sir, going. Can we, can we turn off? I cannot, sir. Please. I know you're aware of our body cam policy. You know I cannot turn I, off this body I cam. I do, but I'd like to talk to you. 
I can't mm -hmm. do that, sir. Please. Are you going to do the test or not? Will you please talk to me? I'll talk you, to you once we're done. You can done. turn it off. You can turn it on. I can turn it off once I'm done with my investigation, sir. Okay. I'm a captain on this police department. I understand that, sir. I get And that. I am a sergeant on this police officer, and I I'm taking not. an oath to uphold the law. I, I don't not. show favoritism to anyone, regardless. Okay, maybe this guy is a bit of a fucking uh, good cop, I guess. Well, not good cop, but like, like he's a he's a rule follower. Okay, because the other guys were like way more apologetic. This is some RoboCop shit right here. So I don't I, care if you're a gangbanger or the president. I want you guys to also understand something. We're talking about Oklahoma police departments here. Okay, these guys are like these guys have have serially done child endangerment and and uh, uh child sexual assault and and sexual assault of of uh you know women uh, older than the age of 18 so like a couple years prior was it Oklahoma City Police Department that where they basically had to fucking fire like like 20 cops or some shit let me see if i can find it Oklahoma County DA dismisses criminal charges of seven police officers who shot and killed three people. Okay, that one is, that's not what I'm talking about. What was it? It was like, it was around the Daniel Holtzclaw situation where Daniel Holtzclaw went to, uh, went to prison for being convicted of multiple counts of rape, sexual battery, forcible oral sodomy, and other sexual charges while working for the Oklahoma City Police Department. But after he went to prison, they fired like... They fired, like, eight other fucking cops. This is actually a really weird case. If you guys remember, Post Law was in Oklahoma. Yeah, I know. I, I know. It was a very weird case because it was, like, it was a very weird case because uh, Daniel Holtzclaw's situation was, like, not as open and shut. And then there were a lot of other fucking cops. There were a lot of other cops that actually, uh, uh, what do you call it? That had actually also been fired later down. Uh, a couple, like a couple years later. Like it almost seemed like it was a fall guy or something. Yeah, there was a bunch of victims and some of the victims described very different people than Daniel. And yet they fucking, they clapped him. They clapped him for all of the victims. And he was like a, like a bit of a, he was a bit of an interesting case because he was like, uh, uh, what do you call it? He was a, he was a really interesting case specifically because uh conservative columnist michelle malkin has written about the case and has repeatedly argued she believes holt's cause is innocent arguing that the forensic evidence backs his claims and the story he provided not the accused's versions and that the investigators chose not to perform several tests she categorized as routine or characterized as routine malkin debuted her first and second episodes jason flom a founding board member of the innocence project dedicated an episode of a wrongful conviction podcast that is interviews with holt's claw his sister and a biologist who claims to have detected errors in the prosecution of the case. Like, he could have been, he could have been the fall guy for, like, basically a rape ring inside of the Oklahoma City Police Department. Like, that's what it, that's what it felt like a little bit. Especially because they, especially because they fucking fired, like, they fired so many cops. Uh, they fired so many cops after this case. Where the fuck? Why can't I find it? Not charged, but fired. Brandon Paisley, senior director, specialized targeting. A fired Oklahoma City Police Department officer is back behind bars facing new complaints of rape and sexual abuse. There was the Luis Maldonado case. Court dismisses rape and strangulation charges against former Oklahoma City police uh, officer. Fuck, where is it? It's a really weird... Oh, here, this, this, this. This is what I was looking for. Hundreds of officers lose licenses over sex misconduct. I think this is the one, right? Flashing lights pierced the black night, uh, black of the night, and big white letters made it clear it was the police. The woman pulled over was a daycare worker in her 50s. She would later tell a judge she splayed outside of a patrol car for pat down, made her lift her shirt to prove she wasn't hiding anything, then pulled down her pants, and the officer still wasn't convinced. Shone his flashlight between her legs. 
In a year-long investigation of sexual misconduct by U.S. law enforcement, the Associated Press uncovered about 1,000 officers who lost their badges in a six-year period for rape, sodomy, and other sexual assault. Sex crimes that included possessions of child pornography or sexual misconduct, such as propositioning citizens or having consensual but prohibited on-duty intercourse. The number is unquestionably an undercount because it represents only those officers whose licenses to work in law enforcement were revoked and not all states take such action. California and New York with several other nations law enforcement agencies offer no records because they have no statewide system to decertify officers for misconduct. In one of the 13 women uh, who say they were victimized by officer, former college football standout named Daniel Holtz called the fire. The fire cop 28 is pleaded not guilty to host the charges, but there were a hundred other Oklahoma cops, 100 other Oklahoma police department, Oklahoma City Police Department cops that were literally, what the fuck they mentioned his high school football for? Because he was like, um, he was like a, like a, how do I describe it? He's like in great shape. Like they, they presented this as like a story that was unique. Uh, they, they presented this as a story that, because he was like, unique for uh law enforcement at the time that he was like an all-american boy that's the way the hometown hero right and the thing is um the thing is like it felt like uh it felt like he probably participated in in a string of like sexual assault just like every other fucking cop did but then they hammered him with every charge they could specifically to like nip it in the bud you know what i mean like they, it, it, it almost felt like it was like a young guy on the force. So they were like, look, look, this is the one guy that did it. The one bad cop. Does that make sense? But it's on, it's nutty. In the United States. Sir, I'm not asking you for that. If I was to treat you differently than I was to treat like some South side loco or some pedo, how's that look on me? Okay. I'm not asking you for that. Because I wouldn't do that for any of them. Even as the captain begs him to turn his camera off and just talk, the officer stands his ground and states that he has to treat everyone the same or his job and livelihood could be at risk. He's showing a fantastic amount of integrity that unfortunately we don't get to see too often, likely due to people like this trying to pull rank. They then continue with the third and final test, involving simply walking heel to toe for 10 steps. All right, anytime you're ready, you may begin. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Go ahead and turn around for me. Put your hands behind your back. Are you going to arrest me, sir? Yes, I am. Can I talk to you? Go ahead and put your hands behind your back, sir. Now that the investigation is concluded and the purpose placed under arrest, the officer turns off his camera and returns the captain to the police department. Not only was he suspended from his position as Oklahoma police captain, but he was also hit with the regular punishments for DUI, likely amounting to a small fine and a few months in jail, a punishment that Stephanie Lazarus makes look like absolutely nothing. After decades of investigations, DNA evidence revealed that Stephanie was very likely the culprit of a murder committed in 1986. Six. Because of the high stakes nature of the case, the detectives made sure to meticulously plan this interrogation. Stephanie was a really successful detective herself, and she had recently received recommendations for her good work on a theft case. So the detectives used this and brought her in under the guise that they needed help with a case. I don't want to talk about this in the squadron because I, I don't know who people are listening. And if we go to my side, everybody's always wondering what everybody else is doing. Okay. An interrogation room is a strange place for such a conversation to take place, so to put her mind at ease, detectives told her this was the place they'd least be likely to be overheard, as the case details were strictly confidential. Sherry Rasmussen's body had been found at her home after being shot three times. At the time, police suspected the murder was a result of a burglary gone wrong, but the case went cold when they couldn't identify the suspect. However, 23 years later, when revisiting the case, detectives found evidence that led them towards Stephanie, a girl who had been trapped in a love triangle. You want me to skip this one because we already saw it? Oklahoma City police fired 44 
officers for sexual misconduct. This represents 3.5% of their entire force of 1,235 officers. No, nah, don't Triangle skip. With okay. Sherry and her husband, John Rutten. So the detectives decided to bring up John's name to see how she'd react. Were you guys friends, close friends? Yeah, we're very close friends. Yeah. I mean, what's this all about? It's a case we're working on. It involves John, and in there, there's notes and stuff that he, that he knew you and stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, we good friends. Um, lived in the dorms for... I lived in the dorms for two years. Was there ever any relationship or anything that developed between you guys? Yeah, I mean, we dated... Uh, uh -huh. You know, um, I mean, is, what's this all about? Well, it's relating to uh, his wife. Both the detectives and Stephanie have tried to seem as friendly and relaxed as possible around each other. But Stephanie is obviously starting to get very anxious at this point. Even though the detectives gave a somewhat believable Classic. excuse. This might literally be the first JCS I ever reacted to, actually. This one was on JCS. I, I think this literally might be the first ever JCS I reacted to. She is now in an interrogation room faced by two detectives being questioned about a girl she supposedly murdered 20 years Certified earlier. Banger. Her breathing has become faster and her language is defensive and her movements have become more erratic. And you're right. I mean, if you guys are claiming that I'm a suspect, then, you know, I, I got a problem with, you know, with that. Okay. Okay. So... You know, if you're if you're doing this as an interrogation, you're saying, "Hey, I'm a suspect." Well, I, now I got a problem. Her eyes. Know, now you're accusing me of this. Is that what you're Is that what you're saying? Obviously, you know about all the DNA stuff and things of the nature that you know gets done on cases nowadays. You know, if we asked you for a, a DNA swab, would you be willing to give us one? Well, maybe. Because <laughs> now, 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 yeah, because now, now I'm thinking I probably need to talk to a lawyer. Stephanie chooses to provide DNA evidence, hoping her willingness to help out would ultimately prove her innocence. But unfortunately for her, just five minutes later, the detectives decide they've heard enough and put her in cuffs. Months later, after a long and arduous trial, a decision was made by the jury. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Stephanie Eileen Lazarus, guilty of the crime of murder of Sherry Rasmussen. We further find the murder was of the first degree. Stephanie was sentenced to 27 years in prison after being hit with a single felony charge of first degree murder. But to this next cop, Jalen Fleer, a single felony charge looks like child's play. Oh! I remember this one too. This was a recent one. Alright, we'll skip this one. We watched this like recently. This guy was like trying to fuck uh, minors. Yeah, children under the age of 14, pandering children under 16, and engaging in the child under the age of 16. A few months later, he was sentenced to 12 years in prison, a fraction of the amount. That's a, that's a pedo cop. Pedo cop. Like Robocop, but. Grant Harden received after a murder investigation led to the shocking discovery of a crime committed over a decade earlier. Grant has been apprehended on suspicion huh? of murder, but the secret Good. he was hiding would end up making him so desperate he would try everything he possibly could to escape. On the 23rd of February, <laughs> James Appleton <laughs> had pulled into a parking lot on Ganridge Road to take a phone call with his brother-in-law. Suddenly, a loud banging sound was heard over the phone, and the line went dead. A passerby had spotted a white Chevrolet Malibu parked behind James's car that immediately sped away after the loud noise. When the passerby went to check on James, he was lying dead at the wheel. <laughs> He's a rogue build. <laughs> Lock picking plus one. My man, he's like, you have to try the door. Okay? You got to do it to him. You know what I mean? Hey, listen, listen, listen. It's a freebie. <laughs> if it's open, it's a freebie. They have to let you go. Cop rules. Gunshot wound to the head. Gateway, Arkansas is a small town of 400 people, so the owner of the Chevy was quickly determined to be Grant Hardin, a 50-year-old police officer who had lived in this town his whole life. Later that night, Grant's vehicle was stopped at a police roadblock after taking his family out for dinner, and he was quickly brought in for questioning. But unfortunately for everyone involved, Grant's experience in law enforcement would prove to make this interrogation one of the most excruciating and difficult that Arkansas 
Arkansas police had ever had to deal with. I'm Detective Chamberlain. I know we have met James Chamberlain. Okay. Uh, I, did you used to be a police officer somewhere? Or, I, I recognized you, but I wasn't 100% sure where I knew you from. But somebody said that you used to be a police officer in Gateway or something like that. Okay. The interrogation begins casually as Detective Chamberlain opens with questions about Grant's career. As they're both police officers, he assumes he can strike an immediate middle ground with him, building trust between them and hopefully getting him to relax so he'd give up information easier. A strategy that he'd soon find out had the opposite effect. Grant is then read his rights, but decides this is where he's going to start making it difficult for the detectives. Here's the thing. I want to talk to you about what, what you've done today, okay? Can you just take me through when you woke up this morning to when you got stopped by the police out there in, what's the name of that road you're on? I'm sorry, I'm going to drop Game Ridge. I'm not going to say anything after I've been read those rights yet. Okay. Well, I don't know what's going on. I am kind of sickly <laughs> to, uh, to what I'm here for and things. Up until this point, Grant hasn't been told what he's been brought in for, and yep. states that he's feeling sickly, given the circumstances he's been put into. Given his disturbing body language, he may also be feeling exposed and somewhat inferior due to being the One of the few instances where a cop at least knows what other cops are like. Because we've watched plenty of examples of fucking cops getting arrested, and they literally always forget. They always forget that, like, the other side are just cops and they're trying to fuck you over and they just start leaking shit because they have this like false sense of security coming from the thin blue line, you know? Meanwhile, this guy immediately was like, ah, nope, done this before. Not falling for that one. I know what this is called. What is it called? A Minerva Rider or whatever? You read me my Minervas? Let me tell you, you, you read that Minerva to me, boy, I'm telling you shit, boy. Marinara rides, don't tell me nothing. Once you give me that marinara, I ain't speaking. The suspect of a case instead of the detective for the first time in his life. So you don't want to explain what you've done today? Did you, um, is there a reason behind that? Well, it was the first thing said, I have the right to remain silent. Okay. So you're telling me that you don't want to talk to me right now? Okay, cool. Hang tight right here for just a few minutes, okay? As is normal in a case like this, the detectives leave the room for a few minutes to talk about how they're going to handle the interview. And not only does it give them time to formulate their approach, but it also gives the suspects time alone to worry about what could be going on and form anxiety regarding their situation. At the same time, though, it may also give the suspect a moment to collect their thoughts and generate their own story and approach to the interview, putting the detectives on the back foot instead. By the way, I'm Detective Cordero. I think we've met once before. Probably so. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Okay, so I, I, I don't know if I scared you at the beginning or, or what, but that's why I was trying to, and I can't, you see you see the position that I'm in, I can't tell you why you're here, but at the same time, I, I, I need to rule you out into something. Does that, does that make sense? When the detectives re-enter the room, they try an obviously different approach, this time attempting to set Grant at ease, stating that they just need to clear him from any wrongdoing and then he's free to go on his way. Many people would, at least subconsciously, be inclined to open up a little more in an attempt to get out of there as soon as possible. But Grant has other ideas. Would you be willing to talk to me about your day knowing that I need to rule you out of something? Or I, I, I'm just, if you didn't do anything wrong today, you have nothing to worry about. Yes, I, I would have liked to, but before, yeah. The rights were read, so okay. not knowing what's going on. Yeah, and you understand as a detective, we have we read those rights to everybody who comes in here. It's not just you. It's funny because it's like they low-key can still, I'm pretty sure, get around that. At least now they can. M. Hud says, um, I had to check in. Yes, there is a lawyer with this name. <laughs> There's a Miranda Wright. That's awesome. It, it happens to everybody that walks through this room and talks to us. As a former police officer, Grant is fully aware of all of this. He also knows that staying silent is a right and should not be used against him to imply guilt. So he continues to refuse to answer any questions to try and shake the cops off. I guess my question is this, knowing what I just told you, I guess if it was me and I was... You know, if I was in your position, I'd be like, hey, James, I did this, I was at, or Grant, I did this, I was at, you know, here, 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 and here, and I would just 
be done with it. But at this point, like I can't clear you from this because you could still be, potentially be a suspect. I don't know if I'm not explaining it right or, or what yeah, is going on here. It fine. I just okay. have to, once the once the rights have been read, I have to. Uh, it says I have the right to be silent. Yes. Okay. Just tell me this. I know you're a police officer before, mm. right? You're you're a police officer in in Gateway. It's an easy yes or no. Damn. I'm being silent. Well, I can see that. Cold blooded. I mean, murderer, cop, don't matter. Cold blooded, baby. Look at how, look at the powerful thumb energy emanating from this. By the way, I mean, he's just in that corner. He's planted. We can do this all night. I mean, it doesn't bother me. You're going to continue to be a suspect until I find out otherwise. Okay. Unfortunately for the detectives, Grant is exercising perfect form within this interrogation. Refusing to talk greatly hinders the investigation as a whole and completely prevents the detectives from making progress, all while being completely legal. This is why Detective Chamberlain is starting to appear visibly annoyed and decides to take a break from the interrogation, as letting emotions take control in an investigation like this can be extremely dangerous for the detectives. But once again, this time alone can also give the suspects the chance to come up with a plan. What a plan that is, dude. Ah, the perfect escape. They'll never suspect this. <laughs> Master plan. Nope. There ain't no fucking way he did that. There ain't no way. What? Bro. I'm sorry. What? Dude. Are you joking? I, I was going to laugh. I was just making fun of him for trying. Turns out it's a fucking brilliant move. <laughs> Bro, we're going to run that back. Hello, man, I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, the second door. Never mind. Okay, persuasion check. Persuasion check. Let's see. Oh, all right, get ready for work in a little bit. Okay, we'll just have a seat and I'll get it, get it for you. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Hey, yes. Wait, wait, what? No, they're also You want to talk to me again? What's going on? I'm just ready to go. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not ready for you to go yet, so you're not going to be able to go. I've got other things that I'm doing right now, so. All right, I just want to... I was going to go. Oh, no, you're not going to go. Okay, yeah, no, you're not. But I was going to Okay. Perfect, thank you. Oddly enough, in many other investigations like this, now is around the time where an officer may attempt to come to a decision regarding the suspect. The interview is obviously at a complete standstill, and no progress is being made in any direction. Bro, this is... You, you can't... Let me tell you something. You cannot... I repeat, you fucking cannot get mad at a player for trying. Anne? 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 You never hear me. You always have headphones in. That's why I'm yelling. Why? It's too hot? Okay. She said, why are you yelling? I'm like, well, you have your headphones in. You can't hear me. Direction, the standard protocol would be to either gather the information needed to charge the suspect for a crime or release them based on a lack of evidence. But whether the detective thinks he can extract more information or if it was an ego-based decision, Grant is told to stay and continue the interrogation. The police then try to take some time to piece together more of the story, talking to witnesses to try and place Grant at the scene of the crime. Despite his silence being perfectly legal and acceptable, 
it greatly increases the detective's suspicion towards him. Suspicion that's only heightened when Grant's wife says that his only alibi was that she thought he was spreading grass seeds at the time of James's death. All signs point towards Grant, and Detective Chamberlain goes back in for round three. Uh, Detective Cordero is talking to your wife right now. I talked to her a little bit. So I've kind of got a timeline of where you were and where you weren't today. Um, we all know what happened, okay? I'm not trying to get you in any trouble. I'm not trying to get her in any trouble. You've got a little daughter, 16, who needs her parents, okay? I don't know if you've had a problem with this guy for a while, or, and this was an accident, or you maliciously chasing down, or, or what happened. But if I don't get your side of the story, I won't ever know. We're writing a book. You got chapter one, you got chapter two and chapter three. Chapter one is what happened today, what started out today, how your day started. Chapter two is what led up to the incident. And chapter three is you telling me about what happened to lead you up to that. I know you went to eat uh, you know, out tonight. I know what you said at dinner. I know that you went to Lowe's afterwards. I know, I know everything, but I don't know what caused the incident. And if I don't know that, I've got to assume the worst. I'll let you think about it. I'm, I, I'll give you one more chance here in a few minutes, and I'm not, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I'm not telling you that. Well, what happened? I know, you know, we have witnesses that put you there. They physically ID'd you. The two cars that drove by. Look, man, I'm not... I, I just want to know why it happened. I, I'm going to sleep good tonight. Dude, he is so bad. God. First of all, when you're talking to a cop, okay... He knows that you know you can lie. Like, he knows that. He probably has lied before in the interrogation room. So if you don't fucking bring up exactly, like, that, I mean, I know he can't. He can't bring up all the evidence. But, like, I feel like this is going to be a, a, a speech uh, fail. You know what I mean? Tonight, regardless, I don't think you will. At the time of the murder, when the two cars were parked up beside each other, the man in the white Chevrolet waved the passerby past before the gun was fired. As they passed, they were able to get a good look at the driver. And unfortunately for Grant, it was Andrew Tillman, another resident of the small town who had known him since he was a child, and was hence able to undoubtedly place him at the scene of the crime as the gun went off. Both Grant and Chamberlain know without a doubt what happened to James, but Grant also knows that his only chance of escaping is to continue to remain silent and pray that they can't gather the evidence they need. The detectives are now forced to- Well, by the way, Exercising your right to remain silent is so OP. Try almost anything they can think of to get movement out of Grant, starting with allowing him to see his wife and daughter in hopes that it will invoke some sort of emotional reaction within him and get him to talk. Your wife's about to leave. She wanted to get the hug before she left. Are you good with that? Right. Okay. okay. Unfortunately, even this doesn't work. So instead, Detective Cordiero decides to return alone with a more calm and sympathetic demeanor in a second attempt to build trust with Grant. Often, male suspects are more likely to build a subconscious connection with female detectives due to them often thinking that they're less threatening and more understanding. Realistically, this is the last option the detectives have. Uh, all right, uh, get ready to sing about laying down up on that desk. Right there. So yeah, it's a classic good cop, bad cop, dude. Also, another OP strat. <clears throat> this is the cops only OP strat that they have. It's the chud technique, kind of like the top of the hour ad break technique, which comes at the top of every hour. It's deployed whether you like it or not. However, there are things you can do to avoid the top of the hour ad break. That is, of course, subscribing. Here's the three minute ad break now. So far. Yeah, I don't know if you'll be any more comfortable up there than what you are now. Can you help me understand how we got to this point? Miss Suze YB, thank you for the five gift. Man, I remember. Being on patrol and running into you one night. Help me out on a call. Back me up. Uh, it was way back in, uh, I guess almost three years now. Well, two, two, man, years. I felt something myself. Like yeah, something like that. You guys are always good to help us, help, help. 
helped me too. Yeah, absolutely. Brad, he was always right there, man. Cordillero opens up with an anecdote about how Grant apparently backed her up on a case three years ago. Even though he doesn't necessarily remember it, this will give him the idea that Cordillero will be even more sympathetic and helpful towards him as he's done her a favor in the past. It also allows them to continue reminiscing about their time on the force and the people they've worked with, further strengthening the subconscious bond Grant will be creating. I just don't understand how we got to this point. Yeah, me neither. You're on the top. Oh, I'm you? just afraid to go to bed. I don't blame you. Me too. <laughs> me too. And we could do that. You just talk to me. <laughs> well, I just have to. Since you read those rides, I have to stay. I have to do the ride. Well, what? Right. What's the difference? The only difference. Regardless of something happened or not, and if it did, if it was an accident. Well, tell me, like, let me help, help me help you. Like, I want to know what I can do or what happened today to well, be able to explain it later. I, I don't know what happened today. I just need to. You know, people are going to have questions. Mm -hmm. Your family. Well, I have questions. Well, exactly. So. So why can't we figure this out together? Cordero is making a conscious effort to use inclusive language, such as, we will figure this out together. This and her open and expressive body language are both techniques she's using to make Grant feel more relaxed, and as though he's part of the solution, not the problem. She's also making every effort to be nice to Grant, in hopes that maybe he'll finally open up to her, or at least give her a way in. We can start from the very beginning. I mean, I know you probably slept in because you work nights, I work nights. Trust me, I worked nights for almost four years. I understand how mm -hmm. that sleep schedule is. Yeah, I was asleep, so I'm so messed up. Did you sleep in today? Yeah, <laughs> I bet you did. You could have got to work tonight, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Bro, this is not a rewatch. Shut up. It's not a rewatch. I don't think we've watched this before. I don't remember this. What time did you get up? Yeah. Around noon. That's usually what time I got up too. Did you watch anything good on TV? Usually that's what I do. I eat and watch TV. I woke myself up a little bit. <laughs> anything good? Same old stuff. Oh yeah? On TV. You watch the same episodes? Or like, do you have a specific TV show you would wake up and watch? Well, we watched, uh, I mean, my wife always has it on, a, I can't remember what channel it's called, right now, TV Land. Oh, okay. I haven't really watched any of that. I don't even, I couldn't even tell you what it was about. Is your wife like that? Oh, yeah, I think she's been watching other stuff. Better than that. <laughs> no, like, yeah. Oh, my God, we watched this. Oh, my God, it you're right. Might not be about. Oh, my God, I just remembered because she talks about TV land. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, she rizzed them up. Oh, my God, she rizzed them up. You're right. Because he was just, like, refusing. He was not opening up at all. And then she starts talking about, like, TV and his wife and whatever, and he's like, <laughs> yeah, TV. About the case, but finally, Grant is talking, and Cordero has found her way in. If she can keep the flow of this conversation up, she might be slowly able to extract information from him, even without him knowing. Talking about specifics such as TV shows and sleep schedules, even that could lead to catching him in a lie, and placing him in certain places. Nothing more cringe than immediately not remembering something. Uh, and people going, welcome to long COVID memory. Like, I think it's my worst pet. Like, it, it, it probably, it probably is the most annoying thing on the planet. Because it completely, like, it, it's basically the liberal version of uh, asking if someone is vaccinated. You know what I mean? Like, it's the, it's the, it's the liberal, is the radlib version of being like, oh, it must be long COVID. Or... It must be because I react to tens of thousands of hours of footage, like, and sometimes it gets a little blurry. You know what I mean? Nope. You must be, you must have uh, a, a disability, a permanent disability due to COVID now. I don't remember you watching this and I literally was watching when you did. So like you react so much. So many motherfuckers are, yeah. No, I know we already established that I watched this. Just we already established that I watched this. Yes, I said I did. I was wrong for thinking that I did not. Um, we watched it on, I think, maybe JCS or something. But regardless, 
Yeah, the reason why I can't remember it until like the TV land moment was because that was like a pivotal moment in the fucking interview where he finally breaks. But yeah, I do get really, I get, I get triggered when people immediately are like, oh, you can't remember something. It mustn't be that you react to thousands of hours of footage all day, every fucking day. It must be because you have like long COVID or if someone is like, if someone's like, oh, my food tastes weird today. Oh, must be long COVID. It's like, what, what are we doing? Shove your fist in their ass. No, I'm not going to do that. Like, not everything is fucking long COVID, man. Okay. Places at certain times. But most importantly, she's building a connection with him and continuing to let him talk, which increases the chance that he either slips up or decides to make it easier on the detectives and answer a question. But predictably, as soon as Cordero started asking him to talk about the case again, he shut down once more, refusing to answer any more questions and staying silent. I think you have a lot to live for. Beautiful family who I've had the privilege of talking to. The way I look at it, is you're a man. Men face their mistakes and they own up to them. Mm -hmm. And they figure out what happened and figure out how to solve it and move on. Like I said, I'm, I'm honestly here to help you. I want you to understand that. I wouldn't spend my time in here with you if I didn't. And that something happened today that needs to be explained. Can you make she a did it. Today? She spoke sweet nothings to him. Even after reminding him of his family, Grant doesn't move an inch. Again, realizing that his only chance of being let off is to not speak and hope they don't find anything. I like you. I like this fella that was a detective here. And I don't think I don't care about any of that and stuff. And I just don't know how to, how to, uh, when I've had this happen before, uh, mm -hmm. being brought in and interrogated for something. So, I don't. I don't care, but I just don't know how to, how to, I think how to be silent. So you here looking like a jerk. No, you're not. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> He's like, I know how you are. I know how y'all are. I was one of you. <laughs> you know, I, just, I had to be silent in here. You were far from that. You're very polite. <laughs> don't you know why you're here? I appreciate you guys, and I'm just going to kind of get a lawyer. Yeah. It's up to you. But you obviously it. something's going on and I need one. I just want to hear your side of it. I want to get a lawyer. After hours of almost pointless back and forth, Grant finally asks for a lawyer, meaning the detectives can no longer question him and concludes the interrogation. But this is far from where the story ends. Between this interrogation and the final court hearing, Grant and his lawyer both realized that there was simply no way he was going to be released scot-free. Not only was there a man at the scene of the crime who all but saw him pull the trigger, people were also starting to realize that he'd actually either been fired or resigned from three different police force jobs before becoming the chief of police in his hometown. So on October 16th, 2017, Come on, man. It takes this guy murdering somebody in fucking broad daylight for people to be like, wait a minute, let's check his LinkedIn real quick. Oh, shit. I fucking told you, man. It has nothing to do with what he did on the job. He was destined to be a police chief. You want to know why? You want to know why he was destined to be a fucking police chief, dude? Because of how much of a thumb he looks like. That's it. Thumbelina ass motherfucker, bro. That's it. Apparently he's free now. Wait, what? What is this? There's also information about video games. He pleaded guilty to the first degree murder, but refused to reveal his motive, leaving each member of James Appleton's family without closure to this day. However, as Grant was being prosecuted, a shocking revelation was made that turned him, a murderer, into a senseless monster of a human being. As his DNA was being taken, they realized it was already in the system, under an unknown name for a crime committed almost 20 years ago. In November of 1997, a teacher at Frank Tillery Elementary School went to the teacher's lounge bathroom only to be met by a man brandishing a gun that forced her into a stall. The man then ripped her and fled, taking care not to touch anything or leave evidence behind, except for the 
Atkin left on her clothes. Local police did everything they could to identify the perp, but after 20 months of effort, the investigation went cold until 20 years later, when Grant Hardin's DNA was found to be a perfect match. This and is new. because Roger's police had obtained a John Doe warrant back in 2003, allowing them to arrest an unknown suspect and bypass the statute of limitations, he was hit with the 14-year sentence for his on top of the 21 years for the murder of James Appleton. And Chess said this guy's free right now? There ain't no fucking way he's free. How's he free? And as such, Grant Hardin was sentenced to 35 years in prison, meaning that he'll likely live out the rest of his life behind. And, and he's six foot. Fucking bullshit, dude. Doing disrespect. He's not. Inmate search. Wait, what? This is a website you could do? Information current is 09. Okay, 91. Oops. What the fuck am I doing? What, what, are, what are we clicking on here? What am I? No, it's fine. Nothing leaked. It's just the prison. Okay. You can send him money. You can, what, what are you, you, you Vine? Yeah, he ain't getting out, boys. He ain't getting out. I worked on Vine. It's for victims to be notified if he gets out. I don't want to send him money. This is the weirdest September ever. Feels bad, man. <clears throat> Call him no balls. Yeah, no, I'm not going to do that, dude. Victim information notification exchange? What do you mean? Like, if he gets out? <clears throat> like, if he runs out of prison? Call and ask about TV land. Oh, you can be registered to be notified, like as you're like as though I'm a victim. Yes, it tells you if he's transferred or released, or if he escapes. Is this the woman detective who was in the video? Benton County detective suspended after using emergency lights to get son on school bus. <laughs> I don't know, but that is pretty funny. Detective Na Nakana Cordiero was identified as the female driver. I mean, that's like that's like a perfectly valid way to use your your uh that's a perfectly valid way to use your lights, okay? Cops do that shit for way less, you know what I mean? Mostly for drunk driving. Um so I respect that.